But as you, as you can see, the title of my talk is The Ontological Status of Game Ecologies. And uh, uh, this is the sort of the, the problem that I want to address. Uh, games are artifacts that prescribe that their players act in certain ways and adhere to certain motivational structures during gameplay. And these structures, these acts, are, are clearly things that we, 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 we regard as real, we report as real, and they are furthermore uh, a, a part of what we take a computer game to be, these motivational structures and acts. And my question is, what kind of reality status do these actions and motivational structures have? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking to, to pursue a certain thesis, a certain uh, point of view uh, of what these sort of structures are. And the, the important uh, point is that there is a, a, a reciprocal relationship between uh, motivational structures and actions and the, the, the components of, of an environment. For example, if you, you, you run, you're, you're doing, or if you're, you're cutting, you are, you're doing that with an object. So there's a re reciprocal re relationship between uh, uh, the content uh, uh, of an, an action and, and what you are acting on. So the thesis I will um, pursue is that the, the core ecological st structures in games are based on real properties imposed by cognitive mechanisms to project into subjective reasons for actions that normally support social ontologies. So said in other words, I'm going to, 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 to utilize some aspects of Searle's uh, theory of social ontologies to, to, to try to address the, the macro, the ontological states of game ecologies. And I'm going to have a fairly dramatic, I, I'm going to present the complete picture, so I don't have time to pause and make critical discussions, but you will find that in my, my, my draft paper. So I'm going to, to proceed in the following fashion. Uh, I'm first going to comment on the notion of what I'm going to call a cognitive ecology. Then I'm going to do, present briefly three cases of a cognitive ecology, so the ordinary perceptual case, and uh, the classic game case, and the, 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 the uh, computer games case. And then I'm going to, to recommend a different take uh, on what it takes to be uh, an ecology. I'm going to, to trace a relationship between a general, what I call agential properties and practical reasoning. That's sort of my basis for this investigation. And then I'm going to use this, this, uh, this, uh, this premise uh, to, to talk about how uh, these agential properties arise from search, something like search status functions. And uh, the outcome of this is that I think that the, the sort of the ecological, the, the, the nature of the, the, the computer game environment comes to life. And, and uh, a central message is that once we adopt this view, we will see that there's a hidden realm of real game actions underneath the, the, representational, uh, or the representational layer of a game mechanic. So let's start with the notion of cognitive ecology. Uh, that's my, my term. Uh, the, the traditional term is, um, uh, is uh, the often used word of forms, which uh, is originated with the, the, the psychologist James, James Gibson, who is defined in this way, and that uh, affordance is uh, uh, what the environment offers to the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. But uh, as you know, this has also become a general term, and this is used uh, in a specific view of perceptual learning by, by Gibson, but we use it as a general term, and I'm going to use it as a general view. And I'm going to talk about a, a cognitive ecology, uh, not, not uh, connected to Gibson, but, uh, but as a sort of theory, or, uh, which can be defined as, uh, or ecology as an object, uh, or the obje <coughs> in the objective sense. It can be defined as a set of objects, situations, properties, or relations, uh, in an organism environment that are in identified by the way in which they guide its actions. Let's look at three cases. Uh, there is first a primary case uh, of, of uh, the organisms which are adapted by evolution to, to, to react to certain kinds of uh, objects, not as big as galaxies, not as small as uh, bacteria, but what Quines calls everyday uh, or middle-sized dry objects. That's what our, our, our paradigm of the real. And uh, take, for example, this, uh, this uh, picture of, uh, of, um, of a park. Um, uh, you can see, example, if you can see shapes and you can see uh, um, uh, figures, and we can, uh, we can assume that they have a weight, stuff like that. But in addition to that, we, we can see cognitively see uh, these affordances, which, which uh, Gibson is talking about. We can see that there's a suitcase which can be opened. Uh, we, uh, we can see that we, uh, there's a tree which we know can be bent. 
and uh, and there is a social layer. Uh, if there was a policeman there, you, you would know that he had certain powers to arrest me if I did something wrong, and I can go in the shop there and buy things for money. Uh, all of that is things that I, I sort of uh, which, which I take in in, in, in a quasi perceptual way. This is, includes uh, uh, language, and you can say that uh, it forms. Uh, uh, there is uh, on, on on the subject side a similarity space in which I recognize things according to uh, uh, this uh, cognitive uh, components, the things I can do with the environments, the substances, events, situations, counterfactual behavior, low, you know, crazy, uh, rough, law-like behavior and a normative feature like yeah, ethical situations. Now co let's compare this classic, uh, this uh, primary case, which is where everything originates from, or, or the original uh, uh, perceptual uh, content, uh, and uh, uh, compare with classic games and computer games. We can see that classic games, Rubens, they are uh, easily identifiable as a, as, a, as a part of the original, or, original uh, primary case. But uh, we can also easily see it as a bona fide um, uh, ecology. There are properties uh, like being a king, there are knight moves, and there are openings, for example. But note here that this is an ecology which is different from, from the, the original case, in that they are very peculiar features. They are like being a king and opening move, they, they aren't found anywhere else, they are particular to the game. And there are also the, 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 the act of checkmating, for example, is, is particular to the game. You don't find it in, 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 in that box or in the square uh, in the first picture. Now compare computer games. They are also clear, very clear examples of, of ecologies. This is, uh, of course, as you can see, a picture from Bioshock. It's, uh, it's, you, you want to pass, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, you know that there is a door. It needs to be opened. There is uh, ice, which you need to traverse, which you cannot do. And you also have, uh, have the power to do something with it. So this is a case in which is uh, different from the uh, from the from the from the uh, chess case in that uh, uh, the objects and events are reported in the same way. So there is a door, obstacle, ice, uh, uh, and things like that. So they are they are but at the same time they are not of course like uh, the reality of status of these common two components is different from the primary case even so. So just to summarize, uh, what 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 are the uh, what are the 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 the, uh, the, the um, components of a cognitive ecology? Uh, we have properties or uh, objects that are relevant to action, like the sweetness of an apple. We have what we can call situational scripts, like you can go, uh, you can open a suitcase, for example. You can go to uh, to a shopkeeper and buy something from him. And you have motivational structures, uh, like, uh, like for example, the openings in, in a chess game. Uh, different ways you can, you can do that. And you have action types, which are individuated by all of these things. And you're running, you're buying uh, uh, all of these things. You are, you are drawing on the resources of these sorts of cognitive structures. And my point now is that um, the notion of affordance is a bit, little bit too crude to, to answer the question directly what this peculiar to, to, to the game environments, because it, it just presupposes a notional agency, uh, undefined, and it cannot, we, we, can, we know that there are affordances in all of these three cases, but the very notion of affordance seems to do, maybe be supplemented by further uh, uh, resources in order to uh, address the ontological issue. So I propose going beyond the notion of affordance, ask what is an affordance, it is, is it a notion of agency? So why not look at the old notion of agency and try to track the roots of, of the of the, the, the cognitive uh, properties? And what is an action? Well, it's 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 uh, um, it's it's uh, according to one. I'm just using utilizing uh, 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 um, a view most uh, mainly uh, derived from Donald Davidson. We, we could say that it's an action. It's a behavior which is inter intentional and and one uh, description. Uh, and furthermore, if it's in intentional, it, you act for a reason. And if you act for a reason, you are doing something. You can you have you're rational in the sense that you, your reason can be reconstructed as a practical soldier. So, for example, uh, this is a, um, if I intend to eat a piece of food. This is an original example from uh, Aristotle. Dry food is go good. Uh, normative premise. This is dry food, and therefore this uh, food is good. Uh, and uh, uh, that that, uh, that normative and factual premise can be called uh, the, the reason for for the action of uh, eating this food. 
And what's important here is that the, uh, the intention then has an, has an entertainment condition. Uh, namely, if I intend to eat this food, then I, 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 I am successful in doing so if I instantiate this property uh, uh, eaten uh, uh, for this object, uh, uh, this food. And I think that that's what we're interested in, this relationship between, uh, between uh, intention and the contents of practical reasonings and, and, and uh, intentions. In the sense that uh, when a subject executes an intention, she is guided in the action by the properties which are instantiated in the environment. So if I want to open a door, for example, I have a practical uh, 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 syllogism, which I can account for that, that's my reason for it. But I also know how to, uh, 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 I know that that is a door, I have a concept of a door, I, and I have the cognitive control uh, capable of picking that out in my similarity space. Uh, in, in such a fashion that I um, that it can guide my actions. So, so that is that is uh, well, then my then my takeaway. We have practical reasoning, and we have a similarity uh, space, which is which is calibrated to each other. This is the basis for for uh, a, a cognitive ecology. So, and that this little bit more fine-grained uh, perspective allows us to, to look a little bit closer at this very question: What is an affordance, for example? What is this agential properties? And it, we can see that it derives from, from the reasons you have. Uh, there are many types of reasons and correspondingly different uh, uh, affordance uh, structures. You have autotelic reasons, instrumental reasons, you have syncretic reasons, like uh, the, the things I like personally, and you have intersubjective reasons, like ethics, for example. And also, uh, uh, like uh, the social ontologies, like money, uh, if, 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 if I have, if I, a piece of uh, banknote has, has uh, uh, an exchange value. It has an intersubjective, uh, it serves as an intersubjective reason, similarity space for everyone. And are these uh, object, uh, these uh, properties uh, which, which guide action in, in practical reasonings and attention, are they objective or are they something else? I think there is nothing wrong about saying that they are objective. They are real completely, they are just relational. They are a relation between my pro attitudes. Uh, I didn't re introduce that term, but um, it's uh, uh, my, the, 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 the attitudes which goes into the, the normative premise and, and the features of the, of the surroundings. Um, so so it's, 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 it's a fact about this cup, for example, that I, uh, right now I don't want it. So it's a fact about this cup that I don't want it. That's a part of the world. Uh, and um, I think that the metaphysics of these, uh, these uh, agential properties, they are similar to sen secondary sens sensory qualities. They are uh, under ideal conditions for reasonings and epistemic uh, conditions and so on. And we also see now that there are an important distinction between kinds of agential properties. They are those uh, properties which merely guide actions, but they are what they are independent of goal attainment conditions. And there are constitutive agential properties, properties which exist in virtue of the fact only that they, they, uh, uh, they exist in, in goal attainment conditions. Checkmate, assertion, uh, carburetor, uh, or um, policeman, contract, money, all of that uh, would be examples of constitutive uh, or gentle properties. They exist only in so far as, uh, as uh, they figure in, in, in attainment conditions. And using this framework, we can uh, find a turn to, to uh, the, the analysis of, of what is the computer game ecology. Uh, um, and. I, I don't have time to dwell on this, but I think that one big uh, uh, um, intuition that I see everywhere uh, is that, uh, for example, the chess game or also a game mechanic, it is what it is in virtue of being having some sort of representational function. It's a system of signs. And that, I think that, uh, I have the argument at the end there, I think it's easy to show that uh, signs simply do not have, cannot have those cognitive features. features. Uh, um, uh, just two intuitive points. Take the chess piece, for example. It has uh, it, uh, it has the property of being a king, but uh, and we have a representational uh, crown and stuff like that. But the property of being a king is is not uh, about something else. This is not true about something else. It doesn't refer to something else. It's just an ordinary property like being white. Um, and also to think about uh, what is the difference between a, a copy of a banknote and a real banknote. They have exactly the same representational features, but they, they have different agential features. So in other words, uh, 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 the, uh, the game ecology does not uh, exist of, of size. 
Now, the, the, the approach which I'm uh, going to use, uh, now this is things I discussed with Ivan, Ivan Mosca, for example, so I'm not alone about working about these sort of notions. It's the idea that uh, we can, we, this, where, where do games come from? I think that one perspective is that there is sort of very close similarity to like social ontologies, like money, for example. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, third, he talks about a certain, a certain social properties which are in entirely endowed to the objects. They aren't there independently of the fact that they are accepted as such. And he, he, he uses what he calls a status function, which is, uh, uh, you probably know it, that uh, uh, things that have a status function, like policemen or contracts or money notes, they are what they are in virtue of applying uh, uh, a rule like this, x counts as y and c. This note counts as five euro in, in, in money exchanging progress. So, oh, and also Sell talks about, uh, about the games in his book uh, as an example of this. However, it's probably not true that games like chess are based on status function directly for the following reason. Status functions are, are tools in, in social cooperation. They re 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 require collective intentions, for example, and, and um, they, they, are, uh, they are derived from shared accept uh, acceptance of, of, uh, of powers and duties. Games can be played alone. You, you don't need to, to play it, uh, you can play solitaire. And uh, what they require is something else. It's not acceptance, but credence. You simply need to be credent to the rules. So my, my interpretation of this, I, I haven't got time to dwell on it, but I think that what is, how can we apply satisfaction to games? I think it's very simple. I think that when we have uh, established social ontologies, we tap into a very a relatively advanced cognitive mechanisms which allow us to externalize uh, in, uh, reasons uh, in, into the environment as if they were objective. Uh, and uh, this is a sort of big cognitive accomplishment. That's why dogs can do it, for example, in the same way as our videos. And it's also creative. It can have different schemes. So, and the difference, I think, so that's the difference between games and social ontologies, two things. Uh, one is that uh, the games just utilize this externalization mechanism which is analyze uh, 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 social ontologies. And furthermore, it is in disinterested in, in the way it, it games are traditionally uh, uh, conceived to be. So um, um, if, you, if money is to have value, you need to gain something for it. You have to serve other pro attitudes you have. You have to be able to buy chocolate, for example. But games, on the other hand, they are just adopted for the moment. Uh, they have pro attitudes which are intentionally determined and arbitrarily, uh, arbitrarily valorized. That's, that's my term for that. Obviously, very similar to, to the loser attitude in suits. So, um, I got, again, I haven't got the time to, to, go to dwell on this, but I think that here we are looking at a sort of cognitive function which establishes a relationship between a uh, reason uh, uh, structure in, in my mind and the world. So uh, uh, when, when we start to play a game and also s in initiate a social ontology, we do something like a deconditionalization. We take a hypothetic structure, like wouldn't it be nice to have policemen, for example, and then we implement it as if it were, and then, and then it actually becomes an objective fact. It be implemented in, in our, sol so, uh, our uh, similarity space in such a fashion that it can guide our actions. Right, so that's important. That's a function of deconditionalization. And note that this is a different mechanism than representation. So this is important. Uh, it offers a different tool to understanding games. So, so how do we apply this to, 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 to computer games? That's my main, uh, my, my main uh, agenda here. That we're talking about standard games, like Bioshock or Doom, stuff like that, to have a screen uh, with a 2D or 3D depicted in a dynamic environment. That's my, there are other games as well, but that's my interest. And what I'm going to do is simply just generalize uh, the, the notion of, 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 of um, a game called this, which is in, in, are in, tra in traditional games, but it, and, and extend, extended to computer games. And it's a difficult task because, for, for reasons that's, uh, that will be, be clear, is that the problem in computer games is, is how to peel away the representational layer. In, in chess, uh, you can see uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there are uh, chess pieces which are abstract, uh, no longer we don't have this very thin layer of representation, but we can still see their functional roles. 
So it's very easy to peel away in that that uh, that instance the representational layer. What we're left with are agential properties, uh, as I pr have proposed, which are uh, are Im implemented in our similarity space by deconditionalization. Then take Tetris, a sort of intermediate example. Uh, uh, what is what is happening there if you w when you are t uh, turning one of these pieces? Uh, what, what is it called? Uh, um, uh, what are, what are you doing? I think that uh, I think that my intuition is that uh, the, the the level of fiction there is just just heuristic. Uh, what you are doing in 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 the in the, uh, in the uh, Tetris game is just manipulating real uh, graph graphical shapes on the screen, right? Uh, and you have a sort of an, an, a cosmetic uh, uh, fictional layer on top of that. And now we get to, to Bioshock, and I can see how difficult it is to get from from uh, from uh, uh, what is what is how do we peel away uh, the representational layer in Bioshock? That's a, that's a problem. But I think that um, um, uh, we can we can do that relatively. The, the problem we're trying to is that. Uh, it's so elusive, and I think that one cause of the elusiveness of saying what the virtual is is simply it stems from a systematic conflation. Uh, how much time do I have? Um, you can go for three, four more minutes. Oh, good, good. Uh, it's to to to, um, uh, to 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 distinguish between what is represent what is representing and what is being represented. But I, we can do that easily by by making a, a, a technical uh, distinction. I'm here just uh, uh, applying the, the UL-based hybrid no no uh, model in which we a game that consists of a game mechanic or rules and a representation layer. Sp suppose you have a report like S performer running in G. Uh, then you have uh, two, two levels of descriptions. You have S performer C running in G, which is just a movement for the graphical shapes. And then you have a, a layer of representation on top of that, which is, is just as S performs a C running. She, uh, she pretends to be running in G. And um, now we can get to, to the point of studying the, the actual content. That this is basically the, the, uh, the what, what are you doing when you're acting in? This is what you're doing. In literal terms, this is what is actually happening. When you want, uh, this is what the, the computer game environment consists of. And now, with this model, we can study what it means uh, to, 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 to do things in, in a game mechanic, which is with graphical shapes. And what, what I want to say is that uh, uh, in classic rule-based games, uh, we, we, the, the, what is important there is that uh, when you apply rules to, to, to existing physics, you have a set of uh, peculiar actions, like chessmate and stuff like that, who emerge uh, from, from physics. But game mechanics has its own gnomic capabilities, which enable us to shape directions, uh, shape actions directly. So just as you can understand the game when you know the rule, you can understand action in the game mechanism when you impose a real uh, a goal attainment structure on it. So a ga uh, game mechanism implements action types, situation scripts, and motivational structures that which can be attained with graphical shapes. Just a little, I, I, uh, I, I know, I want to just, just a few examples to motivate that there is a huge world of real actions underneath these uh, representationalist descriptions. Take a, take a C walking, for example. It's a sort of a form of action which is not the same as walking, obviously. But it's uh, so because uh, take uh, a, a point and click is just a, de a simple delocalization de uh, feature. Uh, 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 which is instantiated with a, with a body in, in real life, but uh, but in a much simpler case, in a clicker adventure, in in, in uh, with an avatar, it's more like building a trolley, for example. So we have a de uh, the localization uh, structure which can be implemented in in several ways, and and which in which a, a C action can do a part of it to take a form of it. Uh, but not all of it, because uh, the attainment conditions of, of, of uh, walking involves using a body. But take a C stealing, for example. One minute left, yes, that's good. Um, um, that, that is something which you can attain with graphical shapes. So there is an action which actually can be done in, 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 under the right conditions in a graphical environment. Um, uh, and then there's a C killing, for example, which, which in reality are uh, very different uh, action types. It's, uh, it's C killing, it's not a killing, but it can be things like 
uh, dropping something off a road or temporarily blocking a key, key, yard, key card because that is what you're doing when you're killing someone in a game and it can be. So you can look at what you, if you look at the attainment conditions in terms of graphical shapes, you can you can get a feel for the, the hidden realm of the of the game ecology, and so that's luckily the end. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, uh, the picture I'm trying to paint here is the computer games are hybrid ecology, so fictional representation and game mechanisms. But the primary function of a game mechanism is to prescribe action times, situational scripts, motivational structures. Uh, and a game mechanism prescribes the functional deconditionalization rather than representation to implement a similarity space which yields action types directly. And this e also yields the insights that you can, uh, is there a difference between classic games and, and, and computer games? I think there's a very real difference. Because while classic games uh, make, uh, must make use of forms of action that emerge from rules, a, a game mechanism can, can shape, replicate, extend, and invent new ones. Thank you. We have a few minutes left for questions. Represent uh, somehow the concept of similarity, and uh, I don't know. I uh, with this concept, I think uh, really about uh, conceptual spaces. I don't know if uh, if you know, and uh, I think that uh, is a is a very power mm, tool to represent uh, different entities without uh, uh, categorize really inside a set, but uh, just with uh, uh, you know more distance or less distance according to the similarity. I don't know if really ontologies are the good tool to try to catch this kind of uh, element, yeah. No, um, Maybe you have yeah, well, well, I have a sort of crude notion of a similarity space. As we know, it's, it comes from uh, I think behavioral psychology or something like that. I'm not, not, not sure, but I, I think about it as, as a as a natural inclination to, to reg I reg regard this one as um, dissimilar to this one and uh, with that computer to, to, to similar to that computer and that is a sort of capability I have I, 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 I am my perceptual uh, environment are uh, are the cognitive demand uh, controlled by me and by a category natural categorization mechanisms yes so that's what I mean by it Sony uh, right so I'll try to ask a question from the corner here. Um, is reasoning um, and or are reasoning and intentionality necessary conditions for an action? And if so, I think you know what I'm driving at. If so, um, can we actually attribute something like an action to a non-human entity? Yes. Um, uh, it's a big question. I think yes. Uh, I think that uh, it is a necessary condition, and perhaps no. <laughs> as, as, as simple as that. But that's a big question because it's so counterintuitive to say that uh, that um, that animals aren't uh, aren't uh, rational. Uh, but uh, as it happens, that it's it exactly Davidson's view, <laughs> and it's, it's a big. Uh, have, do you have a? I do have a, a lot to say about that actually. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if it's. Can take it uh, yes. Yes. I just, so, you know, I asked yeah, the I question, think, thinking I think, about okay, the, yes, 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 to the, the game the, and the system, and yeah, yeah, yes, I'm yes. trying to solve my own questions as well. With right, right. But can, can you say more about uh, uh, mm -hmm. right. what, 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 why, why are we asking that question? Um, I'm simple as that. I was, I, I was actually uh, referring a little bit to uh, yesterday's workshop right. in it. So I was thinking um, if, or thinking with Galloway, if we actions or in game or gamic actions I think that's what he calls it or gamic acts right. uh, to uh, the game system right. or to the machine. I see very good. Yes. Then so, so that's where I'm driving yeah, at. Yes, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I just a brief discussion with you still now about it. And I, I, I think that um, I, I dislike this notion of talking about game systems as acting. I think that's a metaphor. So they aren't acting now. All right, thank you very much, John. We have no more time, so a big round of applause.